Um, sorry, hey, Laura, so that's not going to be playing, right? That's not going to be the backdrop for my bit. Well, this, do you want me to touch? Sorry, is that my screen share that's happening? I sorry. So. Yeah. Sorry, I turn it off. Sorry, I was being over. Over that is. <laughs> Great. So hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sue May Thompson, CEO at Media Trust. Media Trust is a nonprofit organization that strives to connect the media and creative sectors with charities, marginalized communities, and young people to give them a stronger voice. We work closely with industry partners from the major broadcasters like the BBC, Channel 4, and ITV, to creative and PR agencies like Ogilvy and Edelman, and the tech platforms, including Google, Facebook, and Twitter, to mobilize industry volunteers to provide media and comms pro bono support to charities, and to mentor young people from diverse and disadvantaged backgrounds who are aspiring to break into the media. By empowering more diverse voices, matching good skills of good causes, and connecting media businesses with grassroots organizations and young people, we're trying to play our part in building understanding, empathy, and trust that will hopefully lead to a more responsible and representative media and greater social cohesion. That's why I'm really delighted to be chairing this next session, which will discuss how to build an anti-racist media. This is clearly a highly charged subject, the extent to which systemic racism exists in society in different sectors and different institutions has been hotly contested since the Black Lives Matter protests last summer. Within the media sector, in the aftermath of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's Oprah interview, the Society of Editors' attempts to deny that the British news media is racist led to the departure of its executive director, Ian Murray. Meanwhile, despite the critical success achieved by breakout programs like Small Acts and I May Destroy You, our screen industries have continued to be assailed by allegations of tokenism, stereotyping and glass ceilings. We've seen the media sector, like all sectors, doubling down on efforts to hire more employees of color, but tackling racism in the media is obviously not just about the diversity of your employee base. It's also crucially about representation. Whose stories are getting picked to be told? Who's doing the picking? Who's doing the telling? And whose gaze is being applied? And while media organizations from the BBC to News UK have created new roles to spearhead newsroom diversity inclusion efforts, there's skepticism about whether these initiatives are more window dressing and whether they have unintended consequences. Should we be concerned about the ghettoization implications of journalists of color being appointed to cover stories about race? For example, the appointment of Nadine White to be the independence race correspondent, or The Guardian appointing Nazia Parveen and Amna Modin to cover community affairs. Meanwhile, in film and TV, while we're seeing many more diverse on-screen presenters, David Olusoga, Steve McQueen and others have challenged the failure of the screen industries to make space for black talent in behind the camera roles, in the rooms where decisions are made and where the real creativity happens. Here to discuss all this and more, we're fortunate to have a fantastic lineup of experts in Simone Pennant, founder and director of the TV Collective, Sita Kumar, Screen Skills Chief Executive, Hannah Ajala, a former BBC reporter and the founder of We Are Black Journos, and Marcus Ryder, who's had a distinguished career as a journalist and media executive and is head of external consultancies at the Lenny Henry Center for Media Diversity. Welcome all. So first up, we're going to hear from Simone, who's going to present the results of the TV Collective's new study on the best TV companies to work for in the UK entertainment industry for Black, Asian and ethnic minorities. And following Simone's presentation, we're going to hear reflections on the report's findings from Sita, Hannah and Marcus. We'll then move into Q&A. So if anyone in the audience has comments or questions as we go along, please pop them into the chat and we'll pick them up once we get to Q&A. So Simone, handing over to you now. Thank you, thank you. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm gonna just start this. 
get this going. And I also apologize, my neighbor has ordered a builder today. So if there's any background noise, I do apologize in advance. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here today with you um, on such a beautiful day. And I hope you have an opportunity to join this session via your garden. And if not, at least have a window open. First, I want to thank, say a massive thank you to IPPR for all of their support and the platform and this platform. Um, and also without the support of Russell Brinlow from Lewis Silkin, and David Glimmer from Cardiff University, Liam Benjamin and Marie St. Louis, and those who prefer nameless, this project would have just remained a good idea. You can meet the panel of experts um, and talk to them and ask some practical advice around um, some of the survey results and how you might be able to implement some of the findings into your companies at this afternoon's workshop. In the time that I'm gonna be with you now, I'd like to share with you the inspiration behind the project and why I think it's so important I'd like to share with you key findings and reveal the name of the companies and why they were voted the best. There's so, oh, oh dear, sorry, technicals already. Sorry, just bear with me, technicals. Just wanna get this. I'm, sh I'm hoping that you guys can see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up if we can see my screen? Sorry, I'm sharing my screen. Everything is always, it always works when you're yeah, let's see if that works better. Right, sorry, I apologize. Right, we had a lot of unbuying from lots of people from the project. This is what Simon Albury, the chair of the race, cam um, the race and um, champion of the diversity of change on um, broadcasting, Simon Albury. Um, Deborah Williams from the CDN also said this about the project. Um, and we also had Pat Young. For those who don't know me, I have been running, I, I run a networking organization and a resource called the TV Collective. Our main objective is to champion and connect TV, TV professionals of, with color, of color to paid opportunities, the industry and each other. Last year, we worked with Channel 5, that which resulted in nine new production companies of color working and getting productions and getting commissions. When currently working with 51 leaders from black and Asian, backgrounds who were nominated by their peers to help them take the next major step in their career. And in autumn, we'll be working with Channel 4 to launch part two of their Indie um, Accelerator program, where a further 10 Indies will be matched with commissioner heads and working towards commission. Before setting up the TV Collective, I used to work in um, TV production for a number of years and worked on a number of programs, mainly about the black community. I was usually one of the only people of one of the only black people on the team, usually the most junior, so my opinions were never heard or rarely heard. And I was often told when finding characters, that black guy's good and it's great that he's articulate, but he's not gangster enough. The narratives all felt the same and not necessarily based on reality. And I wondered to myself whether these programs only existed to reinforce the assumptions and stereotypes that these producers had about my community. I often felt so confl conflicted, but the advice I got from my peers and particularly my black peers at the time, was stay quiet. This could damage your career. So I stayed quiet and I, and I paid the mortgage. Whilst one day, whilst shooting on location and yet another black on black crime documentary, I received a call telling me my son had been taken to hospital for a minor operation. By the time I got to hospital, my son had died of a heart attack because he had been held down um, after coming through an operation, being very agitated by security. I couldn't comprehend what they were saying. How could he be held down by security? He was 14, I was confused. I didn't understand how this could happen. And then the penny dropped. People did not see a 14 year old boy who was frightened. They saw a thug, they saw a gangster. And actually some of the programs that I had worked on had reinforced that image. From that moment onwards, I promised myself I'd never keep quiet again. Over the last 15 years, I've dedicated my work to, to trying to diversify not only the decision makers and the programs, but also ensuring that people of color have ownership on at least what's this, at least, or at least to say on how they're being portrayed. Now, I'm not gonna lie, progress has been slow and there has been a few small wins, but what I'm finding about this space is that people are more comfortable just talking about the issues rather than taking real action then. The, traffic, the tragic death of George Floyd happened. Apart from being extremely triggered, I was comforted by the global response, 
really inspired by the black talent who stepped forward and their bravery to share stories about discrimination that they had experienced, particularly working in TV, and kind of hopeful by the promises and pledges production companies have made. Um, and for a moment, because of the sheer intensity of the, of, the, of the moment, it felt like change. I am constantly in contact with talent of color who are looking, who are looking for opportunities and share the frustrations that I had when I was working in TV so many years ago. I'm constantly bombarded by companies who are struggling and wanting to diversify their teams, but are still struggling. I wanted to know what was working, what companies were doing right, and so that I could use them as an example. With that in mind, I present to you the best production companies, best broadcasters, and the companies that you would, you would recommend to your friend. What we did, the study took about eight months from the initial design to receiving the data, um, framed, framed by the quantitative study, sorry, the quantitative, um, framed by quantitative survey crafted by a panel of experts. Survey participants were asked to evaluate their employers and other companies, they've stood, they stood out to them positively. The study, we had 470 study, um, 470 respondents, 44% of those respondents were white, and of those white people, 63% of them had, were, had gone to a state school or non-selective um, school in their education, which should, could give some indication that we were capturing the experience of white working class. Overwhelming response, suggest, over, uh, there was an overwhelming female response. There was an overwhelming female response, um, and that also suggests that there's a lack of men of color particularly at senior and mid management levels. And 10% of people had disabilities, suggesting the importance of um, intersectionality. Nearly half of all the people of color that responded had worked in the industry for more than 10 years. This could possibly give a reason why they felt more confident to get engaged and answer the questions in the study. What the study showed the results initially were really promising. What the study showed was more and more companies are having a clear diversity statement, and there seems to be more commitment from senior levels. Over half of the companies provided clear Black Lives Matter statements, um, and over 50% of the respondents felt and believed that it was effective. The study also indicated that when people were feeling more valued, able to bring their best selves to work, and discuss issues pertaining to their diversity. So things are going right well, right? One major caveat. Of all the respondents that we asked, a staggering 60% didn't feel comfortable naming the companies they worked for. And of that 60%, 16% of people of color wouldn't name their, only 16% of people of color named their production company and 19% named their broadcaster. This means that the results I'm about to share with you are in the main based on the respondents who worked at production companies for over six years, are in full-time and permanent education, are employment rather than freelancers, and are slightly older, indicating they felt more confident and more comfortable about taking part in the study. During the test phase of the study, we noted that there was some apprehension with people naming companies. And because of this fear, we chose to group all the production companies together under the groups that they work with, that they belong to. And we did this the same with um, the broadcasters as well, rather than listing individual, individual departments. It clearly went only a tiny way of alleviating some of the um, fear. And after all these years, people are still keeping quiet. Now, I'm not in the business of sugarcoating. And where there has been change and improvement, the messages are getting through and DNI diversity and in, the message is getting through that diversity and, imp and inclusion is important, but the intention isn't matching the impact. I recently spoke to one of the respons respondents who gave me permission to air some of their frustrations. So this is what they shared with me. I recently worked on a huge and very popular production, huge crew, into the hundreds and black staff were pretty negligible. I remember the first time I heard one of the crew make a racist remark about one of the black contributors. They were filming openly and with us in the room. 
I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They were laughing at the person, the color of the person's skin. I quietly asked someone whether anything was going to be done. Who would it be reported to? And what was and, and was this acceptable? How could we be working with people who were openly racist? And is it being and is this being accepted and is this okay? I was told that this happens every year, this is just how it is, and like that, that was the end of that. According to our study, out of those that experienced microaggressions, 77% were people of colour. They then went on to say that they would have never got away with it if there were more people of colour working in senior management or senior positions. I have seen absolutely no black series producers over my entire career, and my experience has taught me that lack of trust, rarely believed in, always been seen as a risk, and made to feel lucky that you've made it through the dunk door. I've seen enough mediocre white producers become serious producers with no experience, yet simply because they're friends with the execs or that they want to be nurtured. I've lost count of how many times I've seen this happen with my white peers, but never with black. Of our respondents, 75% to none or a small number or said that they were, sorry, let me say that again. 75% of our respondents said that there were none, a small number, or they were the only person working in senior management. 61% of our respondents said there were small numbers or no people of color in creative and development teams. 42% of respondents said that they hadn't received a promotion in the last three years, and this drops to 20% of those from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. 62% of respondents said they hadn't received a pay rise in the last three years, and that drops to 24% from those from black and Asian backgrounds and minorities. 30% of our respondents said that they felt their pay was comparable to their peers, but 48% didn't know. She went, the person that was um, the, our respondent then went on to say, the UK is so far behind when it comes to diversity and inclusion, and willfully so. I've decided to look further afield, away from British soil, and it's the best thing I've ever did. All of the things I thought we couldn't ask for was like work, a seat at the actual table, the senior leadership and being a part of senior leadership and in the board, a decision maker for the first time ever in my, community, in, in my career, real equality. I have, the, I have the autonomy now to hire teams and black people and, and, and no longer feel silent, I no longer feel like a silent minority. Brilliant cultural ideas are no longer labeled as irrelevant or, or niche and everyone's culture is celebrated. Black, cult, black content producers aren't sidelined or palmed off with short form content and they are pursued. I'm trusted, I'm supported because my employees see the value of properly invested in all talent, no matter the background, because they understand, they understand the importance of a truly diverse teams because they've seen the profitable returns. The, require, the requirements for me, the requirements for me to be infallible are nowhere, no more a praying fear. I feel safe, I feel fulfilled. This is my, this must be how white people feel. For the first time in my career, I feel equal. Over 35% of those who were happy to name their company and out of that 16% of people of color worked at a production company and 19% worked at the broadcasters. The companies that were, these companies that I'm about to name were selected because they were the ones that were constantly made, mentioned of making the most positive progress in each of the following areas, recruitment and retention, learning and development and diversity and inclusion voted the best production company or group is All Free Media. Best broadcaster, ITV. And the company that people would recommend to their friend is also ITV. Respondents felt that these two companies demonstrated buy-in at senior management 
People felt valued and comfortable to bring, them full, bring their full selves to work. As the industry as a whole has, has so much to tackle around the frozen middle, transparencies around rages, and more importantly, creating an environment where people are not afraid to speak up, these two, company, these two companies have made a respectful start. Change is one of the only things that is constant in life. And, the only real, and it only really happens when we decide to take action. I hope this study has demonstrated the way, many ways that you can take actions in your organization and where, where the things work, where things can really work. I hope the stories have also inspired you to think about wanting to take action. We should all be striving for, we should all be striving to work in organizations where voices are heard, culture is thriving and all employees, no matter their backgrounds are engaged, are engaged. The happier the employer, the better the content and the bigger the profit. You can pre-order the full report, um, which is out on the 30th of July. Um, if you're interested, please contact me. The TV Collective, we are a community interest company and we are always looking to work with like-minded people committed to tackling action and tackling change by making change. If you're interested in hearing more about the work that we do, um, or thinking about ways that you want to work with us, please get in touch. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Simone, for a really thought provoking presentation and also for being so brave and generous about sharing your personal story. Congratulations, I suppose, are due to ITV and all three media. We're now going to hear five minutes of reflections from each of Sita, Hannah and Marcus before we regroup for Q&A. Once again, if you in the audience have comments or questions, please pop them into the chat and we'll pick them up when we get to Q&A. So Sita, will you kick off? Thank you. And thank you so much, Simone. So um, first, the positive. There has been change. For one thing, as you said, Simone, inclusion, representation, is central to conversations today, which it was not when I started out. Then I was often, like you, the odd one out, the only Asian woman, or even ethnic minority in my team at the BBC, or sometimes even in larger BBC managerial gatherings. The second big shift is that we will no longer accept being treated as if we do not belong. Today's generation is empowered. It's inspiring and uplifting to see. If I reflect on the young me, it was hard to speak out. So I did everything I could to be accepted and belong, to let my work speak for itself so I could get my next role or step up, wanting my color and gender to be invisible. What's happened since it's possible for people like me, an immigrant who has worked her way up in broadcasting and now runs an organization committed to inclusion and workforce change, now it's possible for people like me to embrace our color, our ethnicity, and that is such a powerful shift. But what has not changed enough, and Simone, your report articulates that, is where the decision-making power lies. Still, there is just not enough diversity at the top of the pyramid. And the only way change can happen is at the senior leadership, what I call the tastemaker level. And by that, I mean within cultural institutions, public bodies, broadcasters, large production companies, not just making space at the table and listening, but actually giving up their places at the table. Having a greater diversity of talent in the media makes it less likely that certain voices will be forgotten or neglected. As an Asian woman, I notice when my experience is not being represented. I know there are several industry leaders who can and are making a difference, but there are also organizations and businesses run by often people who are privileged, white men, women, who now want to own the leadership on inclusion or diversity, 
even though they don't have the lived experience and more importantly, don't really listen to those who do. So I would urge, please listen and please pause and understand. And let me give you an example. I received a long lecture on diversity and inclusion from a passionate white man who was trying to explain to me the challenges for people who are black, Asian and minority ethnic and seemed a bit surprised when I said, I do know, I've lived it. So even today, people like me who are of color can be made to feel invisible. And I won't tell you how that feels. But people who are black or brown or deaf or disabled or from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds don't want to be rescued. We want choice, a level playing field. And we want to see, as Simone said brilliantly, action, not words. I have never really liked the word diversity. I've always preferred inclusion, to be included, to belong, and to feel you belong. There's a lot of talk about diversity, inclusion, or equality, diversity, and inclusion. And of course, that's welcome. But there's also what I call a plethora of initiatives. And I'd say less is more. Fewer initiatives, more coherence, more effective and clear action. Black, Asian, and minority ethnic people have not been well served by initiativitis. David Olashuga referred to a lost generation at his mid-tagged lecture last year. I've witnessed this over the years. Hopes crushed, people edged out, initiatives trumpeted and which tend to be short-lived. So I'd say, if you're serious about being change agents, ask yourself how you will enable and effect progression and retention for a greater diversity of talent, how will you ensure jobs? Because to effect real change, you need to signpost clearer routes to jobs and paths to progress, give people tools, soft skills, confidence, networking, level the playing field with those who don't come with that so-called polish. Creating pathways matter. So it doesn't matter whether you have got family connections, networks through school or university and connect people with jobs. Paid placements are a major feature of what we do at Screen Skills because they give people experience and help them make contacts, but also sustain support. So, for example, the trainee finder paid placement program, entry level, or the mid to senior series producer program, they last a whole year. Now we have the leaders of tomorrow program in scripted, high in TV. It's designed to progress candidates to head of department or leadership role, offering coaching, training, and other support over three years. So, so often when I notice people who talk about inclusion want to start with change at the bottom of the ladder. It's easier, less threatening, but it's so much more important to be supporting those at mid and senior level, the squeeze middle. And when you recruit or work with people from groups who are underrepresented in the industry, think, how do they experience their work? How free from harassment, discrimination are they? What creative autonomy do they have? What we find with people who take our free online unconscious bias training or the longer versions in person, we find that even the most, the best intention people find a moment that makes them pause and think. Similarly, our training in tackling bullying and har harassment. Now, none of these things in themselves will create an anti-racist media, but they do shift the balance of power and perspectives which affect which stories are told, how stories are told, and how different communities are represented on screen. And from a personal as well as professional perspective, that really matters. Thank you. Amazing. Um... Thank you, uh, Sita, for your pointer. Sorry, I sound a bit like a mediator then, but um, I guess I'm sort of just following on, um, you know, from what you said and sharing my remarks. And uh, first and foremost, um, Simone, my absolute condolences um, to you for your son. Um, and I think what you're doing is incredible uh, because you are literally creating his legacy and doing him incredibly proud. So yeah, it's amazing what you're doing. Um, yeah, just got me feeling quite emotional about it as well, because it, 
it just immediately makes me think of the the murder of George Floyd and you know the the several things that many people within the black community have had to encounter and sort of relive this trauma again and again as if it's normal to then suddenly see a shift where yeah literally around this time last year racism was a global talking point it was no longer us just you know, putting our fists in the air and saying black lives do matter. So what a shift it's been. Um, and, you know, just touching on, you know, the, the, the several uh, stats that your, your report came out with, and it just literally makes me think about diversity and inclusion. I think I've probably said it the most over the past two years or probably three years since um, We Are Black Journos began. Um, and really honing in, um, for people who are not from a black and minority ethnic group, how can we best define it in a way that they can truly understand um, the importance of it? It's not a box ticking exercise. It's not a policy. You know, diversity inclusion is more than policies, programs, or, or head counts. So it's about you know um, employers outpacing their competitors by actually. Uh, re respecting the unique needs, the, the perspectives and potential of all of their team members, literally every single person. So because of that, and as a result, diverse and inclusive workspaces earn deeper trust and therefore more commitment from their employees. So it was um, a nice relief, shall I say, to see that stat, um, well, sorry, I, I think it was experiences shared by ITV employees about how they're finding it and et cetera. And it is quite interesting because I do remember seeing it a good five plus years ago. Uh, it was either a controller at, at um, ITV or a very senior person coming up with a statistic saying that by the year, let's just say 2018, as an example, they want 30% of their staff to be from a black minority ethnic group. And I remember just, um, reading that and feeling like I, I had like a, a sour taste left in my mouth because why should it be that, you know, in order to have more diversity and inclusion in spaces, um, it should be quantifiable. It almost makes us seem as though we're either a monolith. It kind of made me feel a little bit objectified as well. So it's really interesting to see the steps that these organizations are taking to, again, just stress the validity of our lives. The fact that we're not numbers or things, but we're literally people with incredible abilities that are more deserving, well, as deserving as anyone else really to have a seat at that table and to, to be um, very present. Um, and, you know, just the whole thing about having diversity and inclusion you know, we know that it will improve the balance of opinions. We've seen it countless amount of times in news reports where one black MP is mistaken for another, or one person is mistaken for another, or a wrong name, or a typo, or just something very silly and very, um, if you're aware of, of, of what it's like being in a physical news setting, you have a very clear idea of who is in that meeting, and you are very very certain that not anyone in that editorial meeting or anyone who had an overall say of how production comes out um, was from a diverse background. Um, we see that. So it is very interesting when I speak to my friends and, you know, people within my networks who don't actually work in broadcasting. And I, I, I can't help but, you know, want to ask them, like, what do you think about this when, you know, you hear about these errors and et cetera. And a lot of them think it's actually done on purpose. And I say, no, it actually isn't. It's just down to there being no clear reflection of the people that we're speaking to within our spaces, which I'm definitely gonna stress and, and talk a lot more about um, later. Uh, also very interesting that in your study, Simone, um, the founding, the finding, sorry, um, was that companies that were, you know, sharing slogans about Black Lives Matter and, you know, plastering all over their feeds and etc. But yet there were 50% of those believing that it was actually effective, which is really, really interesting. And I think it's an important thing to stress that issues of racism, discrimination, 
um, you know, colorism, so many of, of the, the issues that people from the black community, those from minority um, ethnic groups um, also face, it's not seasonal. Like this literally happens every day, hashtag or not. So I guess it also leads us to the question of how do we deliver that message in a way that they can actually understand. Um, and I think this presentation, it, so glad this is being recorded. This is definitely a resource that I can share with so many people just so that they can fully understand, you know, see the numbers, see the facts and see the figures and, and understand why, even if you're not a part of that marginalized group, you are part of the, the makeup that can really help to change things. Um, there, there is always that question, isn't it? What can I do? How can I, how can I help? Um, you know, what kind of resources can I read and et cetera? And honestly, I, I think these are the kind of, you know, layman terms kind of explanations that I think are needed. Um, and yeah, I think just as, as a closing remark, diversity and inclusion, I, I just want it to be a norm. Um, I don't think it needs to no longer be a specialized scheme or a, a special event or, or something that you attend every now and then or a special talk or whatever. It should literally just be implemented as a normal day to day, literally just look at it as, as something that should be accessible for everyone. It speaks better for your organization if, you know, your team, um, your editorial team, can relate to several of your audiences, um, come from different backgrounds, can bring different perspectives. That is what every broadcasting organization should represent. That is what we should be working towards. Obviously it starts from these discussions, but I really, really want it to be a normal, normal lifestyle. And that is what I'm hoping to work towards. And it's, it's great to, be on a panel with people that are again working towards the the same thing because it should be normal i know you know when if we just look at centuries ago um how it started out of course it was it wasn't a norm to see people that look like us in these spaces but it's incredible to know that um we are breaking those barriers and we're just progressing with with time so Although I can be skeptical, a lot of the time I'm very optimistic. So yeah, thank you for that, Simone. Okay, I think it's my turn. Um, thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you so much, Sita, for um, uh, yeah, some really interesting comments. And Simone, thank you for the TV Collective for producing such an amazing report. I've had the opportunity to um, read the report and I would recommend any and everybody to make sure they get a copy and order a copy of, of your report. It is an absolutely brilliant report. Um, I'm gonna be brief because I think Hannah and Sita have already mentioned a lot of the things which um, jumped out of the report. And Simone, you've also mentioned quite a few things that I wanted to, to mention. So I'm gonna be nice and quick. The first is that the report reveals that we black and Asian and minority ethnic people are still living in a culture of fear. The television industry is a culture of fear where you cannot even, in a report which is obviously framed in the positive, what is the best employee? Where the vast majority of black and Asian and minority ethnic people are still too scared to even mention their employer anonymously. That shows you the level of fear that is prevalent throughout the industry. So all the conversations and everybody listening to, to this, right, that thinks that they're hearing too much about Black Lives Matter or that their Black and Asian minority ethnic employees are talking too much or saying difficult things, you are only seeing, as Simone's report has proven, the tip, literally the tip of the iceberg of what your Black and Asian minority ethnic employees think. Because if they're too frightened to even stay anonymously right, in a report, do you think they're going to be telling you the truth, employer, about how they feel about the organization that they're in, right, so that jumps out massively, and it's scary, right, it is really scary that that is what happened with your report. The other thing that's really important to, to mention, and I don't, I don't know if you mentioned it in your presentation, Simone, but having looked at the report, um, jumped out to me, 
is that junior employees are even more frightened than senior employees to talk. So the idea that culture change will come from this young, which I've heard before, from this young mass of young employees who are strident and are, are marching on Black Lives Matter, and there's going to be a culture change coming from these young employees. This report puts a lie to that idea that somehow the young people are going to come in. The young people are frightened. The young people want career progression, and they are more than aware right, that they might have a different life outside of television and outside of their employer. But as this report shows, the young people, and especially the young freelance people, are too frightened to speak. Right? And so that should also be a quite a salutary finding for every broadcaster and everybody who's interested in culture change in the industry. The third thing, which Hannah um, picked out, so thank you very much for this, Hannah, right, is that the vast majority, or not the vast majority, I think it's 50%, so the majority of respondents do not believe and have no trust in the broadcaster's policies will affect change. So even if they will affect change, what that proves is that there is a massive breakdown in trust, right? That the employers, that the broadcasters will actually do anything, right? And they'll actually be effective. Now, unlike CETA, I have just mentioned three massive negatives that have come from this report. I'm well aware that having done this, even though I haven't even named a broadcaster, that my chances of now being employed by any broadcaster by the fact that I'm not sugarcoating it, the fact that I'm not saying, well, here's some positive and here's some negative, right? Is yet another black mark against me. I'm not, not an idiot. I have the same views as the other people who filled out the report, right? But for some reason, I might be more foolish enough to actually come on and talk about it, right? But the fear that the other people feel, the fear that everyone has about wanting to be anonymous, Hannah, Sita, myself, I'm sure Simone, Everybody has that fear, right? The only thing where I would, and these are all things which Sita and Hannah and Simone have already mentioned in part, the only thing which I'd slightly push back on, right, with regards to what Sita and Hannah, and we can get into it into this discussion, is the idea of progress, right? A few weeks ago, an absolute legend, right, in black film died, Menelik Shabazz. I was fortunate enough to have worked at a very junior level. I was an intern at the Cheddar Film Collective with Menelik formed, right? What was interesting is that Menelik Shabazz and the people at Cheddar were not trying to curry favor and try and make the broadcasters like them. What they had, and this was the really important point, what they had was that they had independent funding from Channel 4 and the BFI, right, to do with that funding as they wished, which enabled them, most importantly, right, when they actually made a film about, um, I think it was the Broadwater Farm Riots, right, in the 1980s, when they delivered a film which Channel 4 did not like, and Channel 4 said, we won't broadcast it, they said, not a problem, because we are financially, our economic model is financial, gives us financial independence, we will not broadcast it. You don't need to broadcast it. I do not know any black or Asian person now who would be willing to say that to a broadcaster because we work in an oligopsony, right? And we know that the repercussions of being able to get future work and secure future funding would be so detrimental that we wouldn't say anything that we would make the requisite changes that any broadcaster would want, right? Similarly, I would slightly push back on the idea that there haven't been people like us before, right? We had Tariq Ali, we had Darkus Howe, we had Maxine Watson, we had Pat Young. Yourself, Simone, right? And I know you didn't say this, Simone, but yourself, your first job, as far as I'm aware, within the BBC, was a black series producer, right? Jackie Ose Tutu. Jackie Ose Tutu has left the industry. Right? Half these people have left the industry. Right? And so there have been black execs. Let's not pretend there haven't been black execs. There have been Asian execs. There have been Asian commissioners. Right? There have been black commissioners. Right? If you look at the percentage of the population that black and Asian people make up, right? 
any progress that the broadcasters have made have barely kept up with the demographic change, right? If at all, right? And so, the, so we really need to be careful that progress is, a, I'm not saying that there haven't been advances, but we really need to be careful about painting the idea that progress has been, a, has been in a linear line and that, and we feed into the narrative that progress might be slow, but at least it's going. And, and what we're arguing about is about the speed of progress. No, we are actually arguing about what is the progress? Has there been progress? In some places, we've, there has been progress. In some places, we've gone backwards. And unless we have that honest conversation about the fact we've gone backwards, the fact that people have left the industry who should right now be channel controllers, right? Then we, and unless we have that, we won't understand why people will not fill out Simone's survey, even anonymously, right? And we won't be able to address the very real fear that black and Asian and minority ethnic people live in day in, day out, as proven by the survey when they walk into work. And no black or Asian or minority ethnic person can give their best. Nobody can, no woman can, no disabled person can, no white heterosexual able-bodied man can. If they're going into work, and they're actually watching what they're saying because they're fearing that if they reveal their true self, right, it will be detrimental to their career. Nobody with that psychological burden can deliver their best. And what we want and what everybody wants is for everybody to be able to go into work and deliver their best. So we need to find a way, right, for the next report that the TB Collective does, that people at the very least will not be frightened to fill it out honestly. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you everyone for your personal, candid and thoughtful reflections on Simone's report. Marcus, I agree, it's really concerning how black, Asian and ethnic minority talent and young people don't feel they can speak up um, or see any point in speaking up because nothing will change. Hannah, thank you for your reminder that DNI isn't about policies or numbers. Um, it's about real people who face microaggressions or worse on a daily basis. And Sita, I strongly support your suggestion that business leaders should be aiming DNI initiatives at the middle or at the top, not at the entry level, which may be less threatening, but won't drive change or at least as quickly. So I'm sure we'll be returning to the report findings in the course of our discussion. I'd like now to open up the conversation on building an anti-racist media and to start by asking if you accept the premise that the media is merely a mirror reflecting back societal biases. And given we live in a capitalist society, if newspapers and TV channels don't pander to the prejudices of readers, then they can't sell papers, drive up clicks and advertising and stay in business. So Simone, are you more optimistic given the widespread rejection of racism we saw in the aftermath of the football? Everything always comes back to football in this country. Um, you know, the Sun's front page headline afterwards was nation unites against racists. Do you think that that represents a real shift? Um, Marcus, you're a successful media executive as well as a celebrated journalist. What do you think about how the current business model basically drives media titles to pick a fight on the culture wars and to exploit division so they can be more profitable? And finally, Hannah, I know you have strong views on how media exists to serve audiences. Perhaps you'd like to expand on that. So Simone, can you kick off? With the risk of sounding cynical, I always think that these opportunities are amazing PR opportunities and, and a way to kind of say to your audiences that I'm, you know, I'm woke and I'm progressive and I, I'm involved. I think so many people, particularly of colour, living in these countries who have experienced various different things. And I think football was shocking. Um, and for a lot of black people, particularly, I think it reminds you that you're not able to make mistakes. You're just not allowed to make mistakes. You've just got to be, your know, black brilliance has got to happen all the time, all the time. So we kind of, and everyone braced themselves and everybody knew that there was going to be the backlash and similar to Black Lives Matter. I think that after the Black Lives Matter and we saw this kind of, you know, we support this and we support that. What people want to see is action. 
people are fed up. People just, just don't care. People just want to see action and where the action comes. I mean, it's great. I think from the report's point of view that people are saying that, you know, there's more buy-in and we're talking about it, but where it really matters, change isn't happening. And that's, I think, what people really want to see before we can say whether we care, whether these media organisations are have buy-in or not buy-in. That's my, that's my thought. Marcus? Um, I think it's important to recognise that um, markets are not um, acts of God, that media markets are created by a tax system, they're created by regulation, they're created by Ofcom, they're created by um, uh, different regulations. And so I see um, any problems that we have, not any, but the vast majority of problems that we have as a market failure. If time and time again, we are not employing um, black and Asian people, that is a market failure. What has been really interesting for me and what has informed my view on diversity massively, and excuse me for people who might have heard me say this before, was my eight years as a senior executive in Scotland, where I saw um, the BBC from 2007 to 2016, 15, 16, I was there. Um, what I saw in, at the BBC pushing out there is that they were not trying to make their London executives nicer to Scottish people. They did not think that they were going to cure regional diversity by giving them unconscious bias training as to how Scottish people are actually quite talented. What they realized was that there was a market failure and they went to address that market failure. They addressed it as to how they ring fence money. They addressed it with regards to where they place their commissioners. They addressed it with regards to looking at where their budgets were spent. Right? They addressed it by looking as to how do you actually um, uh, finance and ensure that the independent sector grows. Right? And they looked at the market and they saw it as a market failure. They didn't see it as a case of trying to make um, uh, the commissioners nicer. So similarly, I think it's really important that we look at how we address um, diversity as a market failure, right? And some of the work which I know that um, Simone is doing at TV Collective with Channel 5, some of the work that I know that Screen Sales is doing with regards to the market failure of who is being trained and who isn't being trained, right? Is the way forward, I feel, you know? And it's how do we address the market failure rather than thinking of it as a, um, a as unconscious bias or trying to make or try to get better buy-in, right? By the time I left Scotland, if I'm being completely ha honest, hand on heart, the commissioners in London didn't really like the people in Scotland any more in 2016 than they liked them in 2007. Scottish people didn't care. The Scottish people working in Scotland didn't care. You know, what they cared about was how much programme spend was being spent in Scotland. What they cared about was whether that market failure was being addressed. One last point, I'm a massive fan, as I'm sure lots of other people are, this is hardly gonna be surprising, I'm a massive fan of George Orwell. And if you read George Orwell's essay on Dickens, right, what he says is that Dickens wanted people to be nicer. Right? And so if you, Oliver Twist, I'm not looking for the person who is serving Oliver Twist porridge to give him a bit more porridge and maybe put some blueberries in the porridge. We shouldn't have the orphanage, right? That's a failure. And what Orwell was saying was that we need to check, was when he, when he analyzed Dickens, is he said, we need to change the structures. There shouldn't be the orphanage there. Similarly, I'm not trying to make the commissioners maybe throw me a few more blueberries and commission just a few more programs from, from black people, right? Or be slightly nice and give me a bit more porridge. We need to make sure that the actual structures change. I'm with Orwell, I'm not with Dickens. And far too many of the diversity initiatives seem to be more Dickensian, literally, than Orwellian. 
Well, Marcus, um, I'm actually a trustee of the Orwell Foundation. So thank you very much um, for your endorsement of George Orwell and his, um, you know, just he was just prescient. Um, but, you know, talking of market failures, and you know, Hannah, um, that's a nice segue into how media needs to serve its audiences. Do you want to add a comment there? Absolutely. So uh, creative access, two big words for me in terms of um, an incredible... Uh, charity that wanted to um, implement that. They wanted more faces that were representative of the audiences that they were speaking to, to work in a range of different organizations. So that was literally my foot in the BBC and I do not shy away from saying that. I applied via the mainstream route and did not receive any responses. I applied a couple times through creative access and it wasn't just about going through the, 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 usual job recruitment um, way but I felt like I had a lot of support um, because they're very much so aware of this problem that we have right where you know many of these spaces are very very white and they want to come in and sort of change that um, and I'm kind of glad that I, I had that support from them because it really braced myself to what was still one of the best days ever starting at the BBC two weeks after graduating and the security of knowing that I won't be broke because um, it was a paid internship but stepping foot into the building that I'd be working in for my first year on my traineeship, the building of 150 people, five of them who were black, two security guards, two cleaners and myself. That is literally how I started at the BBC. And, um, you know, I mean, I guess there's, there's positive advice that people would say to me, like, oh, we'll give you a reason to stand out. People won't forget your name and etc. But it was problematic because it made me more sure of, the type of uh, spaces that I would want to be in and they would have to be representative of who we're speaking to. So I made that sole decision a few years ago that I don't wanna work in UK based domestic news because I know in a majority of those spaces there won't be people that look like me. And I guess I can say that with someone that has an interest in many different areas of journalism and many different departments, but what about my you know, uh, Caribbean colleague, absolutely amazing journalist who has an insane passion for BBC Radio 4. A majority of the listeners are white middle class. She doesn't come from that background and no one in any of the spaces that she works in looks like her. So it's, you know, very interesting to see how my scenario and hers were, were the complete actual opposites. Um, so I think it was that first experience that just made me not want to be a part of that kind of environment. Otherwise, I wouldn't necessarily say it would dampen my spirit, but it would frustrate me knowing that there wouldn't be anyone around me that I could relate to. Um, and the fear of being the, the token to uh, you know, be fully up to speed on any non-white rela um, related kind of story. And I think it was uh, putting my foot down when I worked in a department in 2018 uh, who produced podcasts for the BBC and a majority of the listeners, English is not their first language. And I remember looking around that department, I was on a six month attachment with them, looking around that department and seeing that I was the only black person, having good rapport with the editor, went for a cup of tea. And I literally just said to him, don't you find it a bit cringe? Like this is the exact word that I use. Don't you find it a bit cringe that, you know, all of your programs, not a majority, all of them are speaking to international audiences, but there is not one non-white person in this space. And his face went completely red. We're still good now, we still talk now, but it was that conversation that made me think, okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing this in my organization, which is worrying, but I know that we exist. And that is what inspired me to start We Are Black Journos, where I connect with so many incredible black journalists working for a range of different organizations, because I wanted to, I wanted to think bigger than that 0.2%. Otherwise, it's so embarrassingly um, depressing, uh, you know, when you see how little we take up in this space. But when we come together and connect with, with one another, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty incredible. It's how I've been able to, you know, meet awesome people like Marcus, Afua Hirsch, um, Claudia Lisa Armour, so many, Charlene White, incredible, incredible journalists within these spaces. So even though um, we don't take up a lot of this industry, um, we are there and we are present and it's playing as a 
hopefully a good example for the aspiring journalists to be that want to be in our footsteps one day and don't want to feel limited by their race. That shouldn't be the first thing that you think of when you enter these spaces. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Hannah. There's so much to unpack in, in what you said, you know, from um, imposter syndrome. How did you not have imposter syndrome? I mean, that is, you're incredible that, that you, because um, we know that, uh, um, you know, people working in the creative industries are particularly prone to imposter syndrome. Um, it affects 90% apparently of people working in the creative industries with all of the debilitating kind of self-limiting effects that are even more heightened if you don't feel you belong. Um, uh, you know, what do you do about that voice in your head that says you need to work twice as hard to get half as far? Um, just linked to that, I, I, I want to just broaden this out to intersectionality as well. Um, and uh, the, particularly the intersection between race and class. Um, and if success in the media industry is a, a lot about who you know and being invited to be in the room, then arguably, class and social connections are as much of a barrier um, as race and ethnicity. So um, Sita, could you um, tell us what Screen Skills is doing to drive inclusion in all its forms, including tackling areas like class and regional disparities? Um, and Marcus, I know you've talked previously about how it's impossible to look at any one aspect of diversity in isolation. Sita, maybe you could start with you. Thanks, I will. Uh, I agree with Marcus about two things and uh, A, market failure and B, using the Orwellian metaphor, systemic change. Uh, I don't think it's about porridge, it's about effecting systemic change. This is why I find unless you have inclusion woven in, I come back to what Hannah says, people need to feel they have a choice. So what we do is we think across, I guess, people use the term protected characteristics and in, within that the social mobility we think about all barriers my view and the reason i do the job i do is to really affect changes in the workforce so that people are aware of the opportunities we are aware of the barriers or the blocks opening up opportunities and making sure that everything we do we think every detail through and think, how can it lead to jobs? What is the support we can provide? A small example, bursaries. We offer bursaries. So we looked at how we could use our bursary pot to unlock barriers to progression. So people can apply for small things, but important, wet weather gear, because it's sometimes quite hard, depending on your personal circumstances, to be able to access that. Or it could be doing, you know, accessing a particular software Similarly, I come back to, we think about networks and we think, how do we help people uh, forge networks, open up doors? If you want systemic change, it's going to require sustained effort. That's what we try to do at every level, entry level. And I agree with Marcus, we cannot keep waiting for entry level. We focus quite a lot of effort in mid to senior because we want them to be the change agents of today and tomorrow. There is opportunity. There is also a risk. And I just want to briefly refer to what Marcus said earlier. We are at a pivot point. We can either really drive change or we can regress back into slogans, epithets, targets and all the rest of it. We're interested in looking beyond that and to make sure change happens consistently on the ground every day. I had to mute my, my um, five-year-old son came in wanting to know about whether he could fly his kite in the house. The answer was no. Um, yeah, so before um, we, we had this panel discussion, obviously the panelists chatted a little bit beforehand and I said to, to Sita and I said to Hannah that I am sure that there's going to be very little we're going to disagree on and uh, you know everything that Sita just said I absolutely um, support. With regards to um, intersectionality and how do we um, drive intersectionality I think we need to look at um, uh, again look at the different market structures and what is working and what isn't working, right? So let's look at one, um, Hannah mentioned um, Afro Hirsch, 
which is talking about some of the great people that, that she's uh, met. And Afro is, is brilliant. Afro recently, so at the Lenny Henry Center, we publish a um, representology, which is um, a journal for media diversity. Oh. And Afro Hirsch wrote a piece in the latest edition and look it up, representology at Birmingham City University. Please get your free copy now. But Afro wrote yeah, on that <laughs> with regards to the Voice newspaper and her experience at the Voice newspaper. And what was really important at the Voice newspaper is that it was a, um, it grew lots and lots of black journalist talent. Afwa went through um, uh, the Voice newspaper. Um, Gary Young went through the Voice newspaper. Nadine White went through um, the Voice newspaper. Um, Henry Bonsu went through the Voice newspaper. Um, if you then look at Choice FM, Eddie Nesta went through Choice FM. So here were um, black media organizations, right, owned by black people, which are able to nurture the talent of black women, of black men, of black working class people, right? And it wasn't, neither organization was great on disability, right? But in terms of class and gender, it just was a natural part of what they did, right? And so what you then have is you then have these organizations which are then feeding the rest of the, feeding the, rest of the industry. And what they're also doing is that they're producing stories just as Black Ballad is doing today. And, um, uh, you know, Gaudam is also doing, which the BBC, Channel 4, are looking over their shoulder and looking at, you know? Charlie Brinkhurst Cuff is at the New York Times now. It's absolutely brilliant that she's at the New York Times, right? But I'm like, why isn't she at the Guardian? Why isn't she at the Times? You know, we are, we are creating brilliant black journalists. And what we need to make sure, and we are, and Gaudem and Black Ballad and The Voice, and the choice before that, when it used to actually do news and current affairs, producing absolutely brilliant journalism as well, which then shifts the journalism which other organizations are doing as well. So if we want intersectionality, if we want to um, be able to have social and cultural capital of people networking, right? The Voice used to put its um, uh, paper to bed, I think on a Thursday night, right? because it was a weekly publication. Uh, it used to put its um, newspaper to bed on a Thursday night. And then at the Z bar, just up the road in Brixton, right, all the journalists used to then get together. But very quickly, myself included, I never worked at The Voice. We would then go to, the Z bar was the place where if you're a black journalist, every week you could go. The contacts which I made right, were absolutely brilliant. That's how I got to know and was able to know about jobs that were going, be able to know um, and work as a support network for each other and everything because the market supported the Voice newspaper. What we need to ensure right now is we need to create a market which supports the Voice so it can still survive and still thrive more than survive, that can support um, Gaudem, that can support Black Ballad. But we need to create the market and that might be creating the market structures and creating finance from government, just as government report, and I'm sorry the name escapes of which government report said it about three years ago, of um, there being direct funding of local newspapers, just as um, Facebook and the BBC have all rolled out initiatives to actively support local newspapers because they realize how they are absolutely vital for creating the news, but also creating um, a natural environment to grow journalistic talent. Right? And similarly, we need to find ways to grow the voice and grow other black, I'm, I'm saying the voice, but Eastern Eye, um, but growing other ethnically diverse newspapers so, and media organizations so that, they, so that we have a self-sustaining media organization that is creating great journalism and also feeding the rest of the media industry. And then when we do that, intersectionality almost comes naturally. Great. Uh, Marcus, I wanted to thank you um, because in your uh, answer, you've actually 
partially responded to one of the questions in the chat, um, which was, um, what do you see as the role of regulation in driving change and building a more anti-racist media? And besides regulation, do we need more government investment and funding? So um, thank you for partially addressing that. Um, I, uh, I wanted to pick up on what you were you know, saying about uh, how more and more millennial talent like Hannah are creating their own networks, alternative platforms where communities of color are creating, publishing their own stories, um, putting their own gaze on issues on everything from mental health to climate change. Um, I suppose what's, what's brilliant about that is that we're positioning people of color as the change makers. Um, what's concerning is that that doesn't seem to be able to happen within mainstream media organizations. Um, and I just wanted to just see what the panel thinks about how we reframe the discussion, because I know everyone here is uncomfortable with that white savior trope and people of color being framed as victims or needing favors or rescuing. Um, uh, you know, we've, we all, we've all read books like Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, um, which have shone a light on the burden that people of color shoulder and having to educate white people about racism, only too often for those experiences to be denied. Um, uh, Simone, in our pre-chat, you know, we talked about how the younger generation are not going to stand for this. They're not as patient as perhaps, you know, we were. And, um, you know, they are going to look um, for uh, other opportunities. Um, Sita, I'd like to ask you, what is Screen Skills doing to support young talent of color to give them a wider choice of pathways? Oh, right. So in terms of, I mean, what's really interesting is I think that the argument is kind of shifted and it's not just about what can happen for black people. People have just been really proactive in taking responsibility for their careers and deciding what it is that they want and having the options to be able to do some mainstream stuff and some more kind of specialist stuff. I think that there's a real shift in that and a real understanding that once you decide what it is that you ask for and be really clear in your arts that you can kind of get it. And I know that there's a lot of issues around diversity and all the other stuff, but that's where my focus is in terms of the work that I do, particularly with the collective. And we're kind of doing that with our leadership program where a lot of people and the, the figures show that are stuck in the frozen middle. And it's just amazing when you remind people just how amazing they are and how they can ask for things different, how that shift happens. And it, I think that for a long time, we've had a lot of noise telling us that we can't. So that shift, uh, you know, I think that it's just exciting that young people and everybody feels that they have a place and that they have a space that they can voice their opinions and share their stories. And the understanding if the BBC or ITV or Channel 4 don't want me, I believe in my story and my content so much that I'm going to take it and I'll find an audience for that. And I find that energy really, really, really inspiring. Um, and if we can inspire people to walk through the industry, not as victims and not as in with cup in hand and say, please, Mr. Man, can you hire me? And to walk through the industry saying, I come with really amazing stories and I come with blah, blah, blah. And if you want to engage with me, you can. But also if you don't, that's equally fine. I think that that's the kind of healthy, exciting space that I would like to see. Um, thank you. Uh, so the variety of ways in which we are opening up, first of all, I think it's really important. A lot of young people, I'm talking about kids in school, I'm talking about kids emerging out of school, I'm talking about kids who go to college, who do apprenticeships, have no idea of the breadth of job roles that exist in our sector. And by that, I mean the screen sector. So one of the things we've done is we've actually very patiently and very carefully and thoroughly done what I call job role mapping. And it sort of has, and again, it's available as a resource within the Screen Skills website, the platform. And you can see the breadth of job roles there is in physical production, in visual effects, in games. These are all growing industries, massive. So whether you want to be, you know, somebody who wants to start something, or if you want to work behind the scenes, I come back to the point of our choice, you are aware. The other thing we do is we do a lot of work with schools and with career advisors, many of who, again, are not aware of the breadth of job roles and pathways available. The final thing that, again, anything we do is linked, I come back to paid placements, progression, routes. There is no point as reinventing all of us have seen what I call the cynical wheel of yesteryear. We were all witnesses to it. 
I've been around the block many times. I don't want to do that. So the change this time is anyone who enters, we try and ensure that they can stay. And if they need to navigate our sector, which doesn't have clear career pathways, how do we help them do that? Either at an early entrant level or more critically, as Simone says, at the mid to senior level. And one thing I really do want to, and, and two other things we do, we look at transfer programs. So for example, currently because of growth, there are lots of key areas of shortages. One example cited a lot is production accountants. So we're looking quite carefully at industries where people can move across and again, help support them stay. So each of them becomes change agents of tomorrow. One final point, which I think it's worth making, and it sort of reflects on the regulation point. We've all seen targets. There's a lot of target setting. But one of the most powerful things in Simone's report, and I think all of us have lived experience, is targets are numbers. They don't really tell you what, how people experience and what they really feel, or indeed whether a target leads to jobs and change. And I think that's really important. The second point, and this is as much to do with intersectionality, we don't seem to have a coherence in the way these targets are set. So if, like us, we get funded by a couple of bodies, there isn't a coherent approach that looks at what does an out of London target do as opposed to an ethnicity target or a disability target, or indeed, do they kind of count each other about out? And I think that's another thing. I know this feels complex and is complex, but I think, Anything we do, we cannot be just about targets. It's got to be about jobs. It's got to be seats at the table. And I come back to, it's got to be about that moment, whether it's in the middle of the pyramid or the top of the pyramid, somebody vacates their place. And those who happen to be, because again, I come back to level playing field, can occupy that place at the table because it is their right to do so. Thank, thank you, Sita. Thank you. Um, we are um, uh, we have about 15 minutes, uh, so we're in the final stretch now. Um, and just before I ask our panelists um, for a quick fire round um, of closing remarks, um, so, Hannah, I know um, you're a champion of allyship programs. You know, this this really should not be a them or us, them and us discussion. Um, where have you seen allyship programs? Um, you know, work and be successful? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, uh, again, George Floyd, his murder, um, you know, was very much so unfortunate. I think we need to sort of step away from, you know, the fact that he did it for everyone, it was heroic or et cetera. No, because leading up to the moment of his murder, no one knew that, that you know, um, he obviously wasn't aware of the fact that something so tragic was gonna happen. And I think the whole world, many people within the black community, when we saw this play out again, it was the trauma of things that we were used to seeing before. But the shock factor for us in the black community and many people around the world were the conversations that came out of that. Again, I was really, really wowed. It was beyond the black squares that people were posting on social media, but real life conversations, people actually reaching out. And even more so to We Are Black Journals, we were receiving a bunch of DMs and messages and literally asking the same question of how can I help? So what I did, I kept note of every almost 200 DM that we received from someone um, who was quite senior from an editorial background that had connected with us and really wanted to help, but didn't know how to. Um, and around that time, I was reading a lot about allyship. Um, and, you know, through the conversations online and the you know messages we were getting, it actually inspired me to create our first virtual event, and it was on allyship. Now, my favorite definition of this term, um, how we started the event and told everyone about it was, Allyship is a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency and accountability with marginalized individuals and or groups of people. It's not self-defined work and efforts must be recognized by those you are seeking to ally with. A very key point that I wanted to highlight was the fact that it was a lifelong process, okay? It's um, if only if institutional racism uh, could could have been dealt with over a, a small 
Zoom call or a coffee, but it doesn't work that way. So that was definitely one thing that I wanted to stress. If you really want to sort of step up to the plate, then understand that this is something that's not going to go away overnight. I saw many tweets and posts shared saying, oh, you know, uh, people are tired of talking about racism. Try um, going through it for 400 years. Yeah, like our people have been oppressed and we've had to be fighting our own battles. And sorry, sometimes it's nice to take a bit of a break. It's nice to not always be, um, you know, the, the oppressor begging to no longer be oppressed. That is what actually makes a true ally. So having that conversation and seeing so many people were really interested and wanting to um, follow up on that was very humbling and quite relieving as well. Again, just going back to not being the only ones, um, you know, shouting for, our, for our, the validity of our lives. So through talks about um, allyship, it inspired us to have a mentoring scheme. And this is definitely something that I would advise to many people if you want to further practice that. So we have about 50 mentors that are looking after, um, I don't want to say looking after, sorry, mentoring, chatting, offering advice and etc. to over 50 black journalists within our network. We've limited it to that number so we can actually keep an eye. I personally don't see the point of, you know, pairing loads of people together and not having that accountability in there. So we do make sure that every quarter, every couple of months, we do check in on the mentor or mentee to see how that's going. Because there's one thing saying you have a mentor or a mentee, but what kind of impact is going there? And that you'll find that allyship, it, you know, one person could reach out and they could be done having their conversations or felt as though they may have helped and, and the mentee may have felt the same way. And that process could be a couple of weeks, some people a few months. But I would definitely say for someone that wants to reach out, please understand that it is a process. It's not something that's quick and short, but you definitely have to be willing. It comes with giving up your time. It comes with throwing your ignorance to the side. And you'd be very surprised um, if you're wondering, anyone watching this, how can I become an, an ally? Or how can I actually reach out and help someone? You literally just put the word out there. I'd love to mentor and help someone. Um, you know, uh, given my line of work, I'm really happy to look at CVs look over um you know any applications or teach you some um tips and tricks because unfortunately we don't have a cousin or an uncle or a best friend that's the editor of of Newsnight or you know any other programs that we could get in through the background route or, or etc it's literally through um contacts and, and networks so if anyone is interested of course please feel free to reach out to me but I think that's just a really important thing to understand about allyship it's not seasonal it's actually a process and not only will you learn so much about yourself in that, but you're actually helping to, um, you know, I don't necessarily want to say offer a seat at the table, but you have advantage as someone from a privileged background to assist or help someone to get into these spaces that they don't have access to. Great, brilliant. Hannah, we would definitely have to talk offline about mentoring because thanks to Screen Skills Support, Media Trust is running um, a whole series of mentoring programs um, for uh, talent getting the screen industries. So um, uh, very, very final stretch now. Um, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to share in two minutes what individuals listening in can do to make a difference. What's the one key practical takeaway you'd like people in the audience to go away and act on to help drive real change in this area? Um, and Marcus, can we start with you, followed by Hannah, then Sita, and last but not least, Simone. Sure. Um, thank you so much. And thanks so much for inviting me onto this session. It's been absolutely great hearing everybody. So thank you. It's, it's been wonderful. All right. Real brief. I'm a big believer in seeing, looking at institutional memory, what we've done right before, what we've, and making sure we don't repeat our mistakes and building our successes. We're picking up on the allyship. And for one thing we need to do is that people need to employ the most competent people, not the people who they like and agree with. Channel four, if you look at the beginning of channel four, dark as how and Tariq Ali were senior executives and series producers at Channel 4. Dark as how, as we know from watching Small Axe, was a member of the Black Panthers and the Mangrove Nine and was public enemy number one. What broadcaster right now would employ somebody 
who had been in the public eye as public enemy number one, championing race and being seen as such a controversial figure. I can't think of any having that bravery right now doing that. And in the 1980s, Channel 4 did that. We need to get back to a culture where we're employing the people who are competent, the people who are skilled, and not the people who are nice and convenient and that we agree with. Tariq Ali, right? He um, publicly um, campaigned for the legalization of weed. He invited Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael and was friends with them very publicly. And he campaigned against the Vietnam War and American and Israeli imperialism, right? And Channel 4 decided that they needed to employ him because they real realized they wanted that opinion and that part of the community because he was competent, he was good, not because they necessarily liked him and agreed with him. So when we're talking about diversity and as Sita said at the very beginning about inclusion, we need to make sure that if we are gonna be, if we want white people to be allies or we want other people to be allies, allyship is about championing people you might not actually like, right? And that's what we've seen. And that's why Channel 4 to this day is still seen, is riding on that reputation they're not riding on the reputation of Big Brother when it comes to inclusion and diversity. They're riding on the reputation that they built in the 80s. So if you build on that reputation, if you have true inclusion, which Channel 4 had at the very start, that reputation can last for decades, right? And we need to learn that lesson and we need to make sure that allyship is about employing people who are the best people for the job, not employing the people who might fit a diversity quota and are our friends. Thank you, Marcus. Hannah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, um, again, just emphasizing the fact that racism is not seasonal. It's something that um, people are encountering on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I know that during a time where literally the globe it seems like we're, we're talking about it and um, people are taking their time out to brush themselves up on resources and educating themselves but please understand that this is something that you're going to have to keep learning and understanding um, about there are countless of resources out there there are so many talks this session is a great place of um, reference and I feel like once you get to that point where you feel a little bit more clued up um, a bit more educated about it, you need that you need to then ask yourself, especially as someone from a privileged background, how can I then implement that into my spaces? Who do I need to challenge? How can I change the narrative of the things that I'm going into my workplace and seeing every single day? And it seems like Groundhog Day now. Is it my editor that I need to talk to? Is it the exec producers? Is it people at HR and recruitment? It's time to look into the bigger issues and, and tackle that because I think that is where we start to break the cycle that we're so tired of seeing again and again. Sita. Thanks, I'll be really short. Um, if you wanna be a change agent and you're looking at talent behind the camera, come and talk to us. Please do not reinvent the wheel. And remember, it's inclusion, it's action, not words. Thank you. I think Last year, one of the biggest moments where I saw the most amount of change was um, somebody worked in an industry and they really worked in for one of the production companies and really frustrated because they'd worked there for years and they hadn't been respected and hadn't got a pay rise and all the other things that we often complain about. And in that moment of Black Lives Matter, they felt confident and empowered to go in and say, I'm not having this and ask for what they want. And they got everything that they wanted. And more importantly, their employee was, didn't even know that they had an issue. Oh my God, I didn't because I didn't even see them. So what I'm saying is, is that change isn't going to happen. One day we're not going to wake up in the rainbow party and it's all going to be wonderful. Change happens with everybody taking action. And you know what action to do because you look around your places of organisations and the spaces and know what you're uncomfortable with. So make a choice. Do yeah. something. Just make a change. It's important. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's not just important for all the, you know, because we're nice people. It's important for the survival of our industry. It's important so that we can keep 
sending out and, and having great content. The UK has a reputation of being one of the greatest content makers out there, but we will die, a reputation will die a death if we do not embrace um, diversity and equality. And then this is the moment to do it. So my sum up is be the change you want to see. Very, very inspiring remarks. Thank you so much, everyone. I also wanted to acknowledge the very good questions in the chat that I'm afraid we didn't have time for. Debs Grayson asked if reparative justice is a different approach that we should be exploring. And Damien Tambini has asked if we need a new Ken Cross review for anti-racist media. So um, IPPR, please ask us all back and we'd love to discuss those questions and more. So a big thank you in closing to IPPR for organizing the summit. Thank you to all of our fantastic panelists, for everyone in the audience who sent in questions and comments. It's been a really wide ranging discussion with plenty of food for thought. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Come back this afternoon for the two workshops, first on how to eradicate news inequality, and secondly, on future-proofing DNI in a post-COVID world, which will explore in more detail Simone's study on the experiences of Black, Asian, and ethnic minority talent in the TV industry. Thank you so much, everyone. It's a wrap. <laughs>